morning to everyone. On behalf of Association for Veterinary Dermatology and Intas Animal Health, I welcome all of you for this uh, wonderful dermatology webinar. Uh, today we are going to uh, talk uh, most common, uh, commonly presented cases, uh, malassezia as a topic. And in this, uh, we are inviting uh, Dr. Lata Mani, uh, faculty from veterinary medicine uh, from uh, Bangalore Veterinary College. I uh, welcome you, madam, um, who has done a lot of work in the uh, in this field and uh, she is a good uh, clinical research worker in this field. I really appreciate uh, her uh, acceptance. And uh, I also welcome uh, Dr. Nitin Pathya and uh, Dr. Manjo Singh for uh, uh, for the entirely cooperation uh, for them for this uh, uh, successful webinars. Thank you. Thank you very much. I request Dr. Nitin Pathya to uh, introduce our uh, speaker of this evening. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I have privilege in welcoming Dr. V. S. Latamani. Dr. V. S. Latamani is working as Assistant Professor, Department of Veterinary Medicine, Veterinary College, Bangalore. Able. Yes, she is a graduate from Bangalore, postgraduate and PhD from Tirupati. She has uh, received merit scholarship for her graduation program as well as for her post graduation program. She is an ideal mix of an academician and field worker as she has been also working in the field initially in the starting part of his, her career. She has been working in the Department of Animal Husbandry, Karnataka. She has to her credit number of training programs wherein she has been a research work, research, uh, resource work uh, person for 35 training programs. She has interest in canine medicine, ultrasonography and infectious diseases of small ruminants. I invite her for her for her webinar on diagnosis and management of molestia dermatitis in dogs. Over to Dr. Latam. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Good evening to all. All good to go. Yeah, good evening to all and welcome to my uh, this the webinar. The topic is diagnosis and management of malassezia dermatitis in dogs. As we all know, can be defined as inflammatory condition which is associated with increased number of malassezia yeast on the skin. So most of the time the malassezia dermatitis is secondary to many primary disease conditions. This malassezia dermatitis can be put it in different names like malassezia overgrowth, malassesiosis, malassezia dermatitis, uh, the common terminology and malassezia otitis externa when the condition is localized into the area, uh, localized to ear canal. So, malassezia, so it is a, it's an yeast, which is formerly, uh, it's known as pteriosporum. So, later it was uh, called as malassezia, when it is identified by the French scientist called Louis Charles Malassez. It's a yeast, which is found on the skin as a common, 
come in sale and at times it becomes an opportunistic skin pathogen in a variety of animals and most frequently in dogs. So among this genus Malassezia, the species Malassezia pachydermatis is first isolated from the skin of a captive Indian rhino, which had an exfoliative dermatitis. This was isolated in 1925. And later in 1950s, this Malassezia pachydermatis is an, recognized as an important otic pathogen of dogs in case of dogs with Malassezia otitis externa. Later in 1990s, this pathogen was accepted as a common cause of canine dermatitis. So if you look into the epidemiology of this Malassezia genus, it has many species like Malassezia pachydermatis, Malassezia furfur, Malassezia sympodialis, Malassezia obtusa, Malassezia globos, and Malassezia restricta. Among all these, Malassezia pachydermatis is a commonly found pathogen, and it's a common skin commensal in the warm-blooded vertebrates, especially in case of dogs. These Malassezia species are lipophilic and also lipid-dependent because they cannot grow in the lipid-free media because of the inability to synthesize the long-chained fatty acids they are lipid dependent. And one more peculiarity of peculiarity about this Malassezia is they maintain a symbiotic relationship with the cutaneous staphylococci. So these both Malassezia and staphylococci bacteria, which they produce mutually beneficial growth factors and, a, and create a favorable micro environment. So most of the time when there is a when the dog is suspecting for having Malassezia dermatitis, there will be co-infection of uh, Staphylococcus that is pyoderma. So this Malassezia dermatitis and pyoderma will be concurrent infections in most of the dogs. And, more, and many times we confuse this Malassezia is for the fungal infections. Just uh, we, we, the dermatophytes but the fungus, they're not the normal commensals cells on the skin. They visit and potentially infect the dogs when it, the, the immune system of that dog is low and when they comes in contact with the infected animal. Whereas in case of Malassezia is, they're already present on the dog's, uh, dog skin as a commensal organism and they cause, they will become pathogen and the cause, they cause the disease during favorable conditions like variable environmental conditions, which may include increased moisture or humidity, or whenever the host immunity is disrupt, disrupted or when the immunity is down, then the Malassezia organisms or yeast, this Malassezia yeast overgrown and induce the disease that is inflammatory condition called Malassezia dermatitis. <coughs> so as I told, the Malassezia pachydermatis are the normal commensals on the skin. So from the birth, the colonization of the uh, Malassezia is on the puppy's body will be there. How they will get transfer? How this colonization will occur on the skin? It is from the bitch flora. Just after the, for, uh, after the whelping, the removal of the amniotic membrane the, by leaking or by nursing from the mother, the pups will get colonized with this Malassezia is on the skin. And the most frequently colonized sites are perioral region or lip region, interdigital skin, and skin of the axilla, groin region, and also the dorsum of the body. And apart from all these sites, perianal skin and the anal mucosa are also the frequently carried sites for this Malassezia pachydermatis. Initially itself, I told this, the Malassezia dermatitis is a secondary skin disease cause with for the uh, primary skin conditions. So there are predisposing factors for the development of this Malassezia dermatitis like cutaneous hypersensitivity, most often with the canine atomic dermatitis or food hypersensitivity, uh, pyomosin also, the most commonly pyoderma and the ectoparasitic skin disease frequently in case of demodicosis and some endocrine disorders like most uh, frequently in hypothyroidism and few keratinization disorders also predispose the development of this Malassezia dermatitis as secondary to this primary causes. So how this, 
how this disease is predisposed to the Malassezia dermatitis. Because of this primary diseases which may cause increased moisture or altered surface lipids in the skin or is disruption of the stratum corneum barrier function or sometimes aberrant immune responses. All these causes secondary process overgrowth. All the normal commensals of this Malassezia yeast will overgrow and cause the disease. So, regarding the age and uh, gender wise predilection, as such, there is no age or sex, uh, gender predilection for this Malassezia dermatitis, except in one study they have demonstrated there is a predisposition for Malassezia dermatitis with neutered male and female dogs. Otherwise, there is no age and gender predilection is detectable for this Malassezia dermatitis. With respect to breed predisposition, few breeds are susceptible for this, like uh, uh, most of the terriers, Dash Hound, Cocker Spaniel, Derma Shepherd, Poodle, Coolie breed dogs. So most of the terrier dogs, Basset Hound, these are the breeds which are commonly affected with this Malassezia dermatitis. And Malassezia dermatitis is often seasonal. Uh, usually the Incidence of this Malassezia dermatitis will be more in during the end of the summer to the beginning of the rainfall. This could be due to in this period, in this season, the allergic dermatitis that atopy also will be more common. So this could be a relation for this occurrence of the Malassezia dermatitis, which is secondary to the primary cause that is atopy. And also it can persist during the winter also. So if we look into the pathogenesis of this Malassezia, so, the Malassezia organisms is, uh, organism will be there as a normal commensal on the skin. Whenever there is overgrowth, the body immune system will respond to this uh, organism, like response to the host, response of the host to the yeast includes some non-specific defense mechanisms like as usual phagocytosis by the neutrophils. There will be infiltration of the neutrophils from the circulation and phagocytosis process will happen. Otherwise, there will be a cell mediated specific defense mechanisms also will occur. Whereas in, in this cell mediated uh, reaction, the Langerhans cells which are they present the antigen that is Malassezia pachydermitis antigen which activates the T cells. So which in turn the T cells will multiply and produce the lipo, lipokines and they stimulate the phagocytosis by macrophages. This process will lead to the destruction of yeast or to their mechanical removal with the scaling. So, otherwise, in continuation of this pathogenesis, the adherence of the Malassezia to the corneocytes, the differentiated keratinocytes, they secrete many enzymes like zymosan, urease, phosphohydrolase, phospholipases, lipoxygenases glucosidase, galactosidase, all these enzymes causes proteolysis, lipidolysis, complement activation and release of the inflammatory mediators. So when there is the release of inflammatory mediators, it causes inflammation of the skin and development of the clinical manifestations on the skin. So as a, this Malassezia dermatitis is a secondary to many primary disorders. So how, what is the role of this cutaneous hypersensitivity in the development of Malassezia? Like for example, an uh, atopy or any other hypersensitivity disorders, the pruritus is the common finding. This pruritic inflammatory diseases creates a change in the microclimate of the skin. For example, to say uh, in atopy, there will be severe scratching. So this may cause disruption of the barrier function and cause the Malassezia overgrowth and the affected dog with the atopy or hypersensitivity keeps licking the body, licking the body or licking the lesion. So it can add moisture to the skin and cause the overgrowth of Malassezia as uh, say congenial environment for the growth of the Malassezia. And there will be increased production of the sebum in case of these hypersensitivity disorders, which also causes Malassezia overgrowth. So many times because of these reasons, Malassezia overgrowth and atopic dermatitis are commonly co-occur. 
and in other ways the magnesia pachydermatitis may increase the inflammation in atopy in both ways directly and indirectly directly by as usual the pro in the process of induction of the inflammatory cytokines from the epidermal cells or indirectly by acting as an allergen because in atopy the magnesia pachydermatis it's also itself can act as an allergen in many dogs which are hypersensitive to this particular magnesia pachydermatis so in both ways the magnesia will cause inflammation inflammation then the role of seboric dermatosis here both the primary that is because of the defective keratinization or in the secondary seboric conditions due to some uh, skin disorders they favor the proliferation of this melasesia species which are present as a pachydermatis which are present on the skin like in case of endocrinopathy such as hypothyroidism and hyperadrenocortisone this will cause secondary seborrhea and uh, facilitate the pro proliferation and overgrowth of the malassezia pachydermatis and which results in malassezia dermatitis apart from all these primary diseases or primary disease conditions of the skin the other diseases which are characterized by the parakeratotic hyperkeratosis like the zinc responsive dermatosis hepatocutaneous syndrome or superficial necrolytic dermatitis is also reported to promote the yeast growth as per the research studies so this also can be considered as a primary skin condition which cause melasesia secondary to this uh, conditions so all these primary causes which cause overgrowth of the melasesia yeast and cause the development of the disease uh, and development of the clinical signs as lesions on the skin so i think you are able to see here this is the distribution of the skin lesions and the pruritus associated with this melasesia dermatitis the normally the uh, distribution of the skin lesions and pruritus will be in the interdistal spaces in the paws and in the perioral region or in the lips in the perianal area in the axillary region in the ventral neck in external ear again we can tell the external ear is the reservoir of this melasesia pachydermatis and again uh, the perioral region or the lips these are the areas or sites where we can see the skin lesions and also frequent pruritus associated with the melasesia dermatitis so clinical signs which we can observe in the affected dogs are moderate to severe pruritus dog will be keep keep scratching uh, either sometimes it could be severe also erythema it could be uh, the reddening of the skin it could be with, with or without papules and scaling will be there on the skin it is a visible flake of abnormal or compacted epithelial cells there will be greasy exudation can be seen on the skin with mal odor and hyperpigmentation again which is a very uh, common finding in case of chronic conditions lichenification that is a thickening of the skin with exaggeration of normal skin markings and when a very particular finding like leathery or elephant like skin will be seen in this uh, in cases of the dogs affected with the melasesia dermatitis and paronychia which is a in the clinical sign seen in the nails and chilitis or the muzzle erythema so apart from all these clinical signs whenever the animal is presented to the clinic we we'll get a, some strong odor of the rancid fat which is a, to some typical smell indicating the, the indicating that dog is having the melasesia dermatitis so usually in the beginning the lesions will be localized or diffused with the symptom with the clinical signs of erythema or erythematous papules and macules and they will be continuing with the keratoseborrheic disorder with the scaling crusting or alopecia so later these lesions will be followed by secondary lesions such as lichenification and hyperpigmentation in the chronic cases the if the duration is very long then the clinical signs the, the lichenification and hyperpigmentation will be seen in the affected dogs so again the lesions can be localized or generalized 
So localized lesions again, as I showed in the picture, we can see in the neck region or axilla, ventrum and inguinal area at the face, in the face, ear, pin or lips, muscle are the frequently affected areas and again the perianal area and legs are the affected and many a times we can see the generalized symptoms or the general lesions also and a uh, few uh, others they have quoted there will be a lymph node enlargement sometimes in the affected dogs these are all the commonly seen symptoms then we'll have a look into the pictures of affected dogs this in the first picture we can see this hyperpigmentation and between there is a erythematous lesions in the ventral neck of the affected dog. And this is the second picture, which is showing the hyperpigmentation in the axillary region where the normally we say main carrier site for this melesthesia is melesthesia pachydermatis east. And here in the, this first picture, we can we are able to appreciate this hyperpigmentation and also lichenification that is thickening of the skin in the perianal region here, the base of the tile also included. And in the second picture, you can see the erythema in the interdigital spaces, which is which also uh, which is the primary cause of this condition it was pyodermatitis, pododermatitis, which had the melesthesia dermatitis also as a secondary. And here, this is a bug okay, presented to the clinic, which, which was diagnosed for melesthesia dermatitis, melesthesia otitis externa, where we can appreciate this hyperpigmentation and lichenification in the external ear. And this is a dog which was diagnosed for the demacodicosis as a primary skin condition and secondary melesthesia dermatitis as a secondary condition where we can able to appreciate this hyperpigmented and inflammatory lesions in the legs. And here in the first image, there are erythematous lesions in the ventral aspect was diagnosed for both pyoderma and melesthesia dermatitis, which is secondary to the primary pyoderma, was by, that is pyoderma. And here the, in the second picture, I think we can appreciate the greasy exudation and scaling nesiporia, which facilitates the grow, growth of the melesthesia organisms and cause melesthesia dermatitis. So in this first picture, there is erythema, hyperpigmentation and also thickening of the skin that is called lichenification with the demarcation in the line, skin lines. And in the second picture, there is again hyperpigmentation and the lichenification in the perianal area, which is an indicative of melesthesia dermatitis. So the, this is the typical picture which shows the leathery or elephant like skin, the chronic conditions where the skin is very leathery or thick like elephant like is a indicative of melesthesia dermatitis and then the second one this having a chin erythema which is also a clinical symptom of the melesthesia dermatitis so peronychia it is a nile fold inflammation case of melesthesia dermatitis which causes brown discoloration of the adjacent claw and also sometimes interdigital hair this is the picture showing the peronychia where we can we can appreciate this brown discoloration in the nile bed nile fold uh, and also the adjacent interdigital hair so after appreciating all these clinical symptoms and getting the history of pruritis or development of the skin lesions since last in so many days like that so we are we have to diagnose the disease to initiate the therapy of the condition so the diagnosis of the melesthesia goes like how to approach to a case whenever the case comes to the clinic a full history to be taken this history is very much helpful in diagnosing the melesthesia dermatitis because it is secondary to many primary conditions as i told so we need to ask about the history also this will help us in identifying the primary cause and also it helps us to ident uh, uh, confirm the melesthesia dermatitis so full history is very important especially if the melesthesia dermatitis is secondary to some endocrinopathies like hypothyroidism so history is very much important so a full history should be taken and physical examination should be performed 
just and also the clinical signs are noted so after this cytological examination should be performed where we can find the variable number of yeasts so this cytological examination is very important this can be correlate with, with the presence of skin clinical symptoms or the skin lesions and we can initiate the therapy so as the malassezia pachydermatitis is a normal commensal on the skin of course with the cytology exam cytological examination we can uh, we can get can see the number of yeast even in the healthy animals also but again we should, we need to correlate the uh, cytological uh, studies as, uh, and the clinical signs or the skin lesions to initiate the therapy sometimes even the small number of yeast with supporting clinical signs should prompt us for initiation of the therapy or else if there is any doubt exist with the presence of yeast in the uh, cytological studies resampling can be done to confirm the presence of yeast so cytological examination shows the yeast and allows it is an actually semi quantification method it uh, allows the semi quantification of the presence of yeast and there are several cytological techniques can be used uh, among those impression smear and uh, by using the cellopian or adhesive tape which is called scotch test and scrape smear <coughs> and swab smear which is uh, normally used for the ear canal and uh, interstitial spaces or sometimes for the skin folds or cutaneous folds so, so the impression smear it is as usual will be taken on the uh, regular glass micro uh, glass microscopic slide is like we take the impression smear for ad skin lesions the same procedure can be adopted here also so here the glass slide is pressed directly and firmly against the skin that is on the skin lesion wherever the lesion is there like this we have to firmly press the glass slide on the skin lesion so that the skin should be imprinted with several times in the same area to ensure adequate recovery of the epithelial cells and debris so this impression smear also can be taken for further uh, staining procedures and next is the scotch test this is very common very popular test and the one more the very good advantage of this test is it can be done in the field condition also with it don't require any extra uh, some sophisticated materials or something like that so we can use we can just have one cellopian tape that adhesive strip or cellopian strip strip which is pressed firmly onto the affected area like this so on the skin the affected here we can see the eryth erythematous and lichenified uh, skin lesion in the ventral aspect of the body here we are we are applying this uh, adhesive strip or the cellopian strip firmly several times in each location in different from different locations different strips can be taken then this tape is placed on the slide and then the stain will be stained along with this adhesive tape and one more thing is as like with other uh, slides we should not heat fix this because we are using the cellopian tape directly we can go for the staining and after staining we can examine at the oil immersion magnification this is regarding the scotch test and other test the cytological tests are roll swab here the cotton tipped applicator swabs are used for the ears and also the skin fold areas and also in the interdigital spaces where we have to moisten the swab with a normal saline and collect the material from the affected area in the ear can in the external ear or from the cutaneous folds or in the interdigital spaces then briskly swab the skin in the affected areas then roll on the roll the sample which is taken on the swab onto the slide like this we have to roll this way that way so by pressing firmly but we should not rub slowly we have to uh, we have to roll this swab on the slide firmly so then we will get a smear that can be fi fixed and stained and can be seen for the presence of yeast and other cytological techniques are scrape smear here we can scrape the uh, smear uh, lesion by using the blunt bp blade or else by using the scalpel and in case of pyronia if the dog is having pyronia lesions 
then the sharp end of the toothpick is uh, preferred to get the sample from the paronychia. So with all these procedures, we can take the sample and go for the staining procedure. Staining procedure is very easy. After preparing the film of suspected material, either uh, by impression method or scrape smear or roll swab smear or the cellopian tape method or so that is scotch test, we have to dry it and heat fix. But you should remember the heat fix method should not be done for the scotch test because we are using the cellopian tape, uh, tape and flood the slides with the stain. Either we can use uh, GMSO or methylene blue or any test um, stains can be used. Allow it to act for the two to four minutes. Wash it in water, blot and dry it and we can examine under the oil immersion. So under the microscope, the oil immersion, we can, we can appreciate or we can see the cluster of oval or elongated cells which are typically single polar budding, uh, which indicating the active growth and reproduction. Uh, the appearance of this is will be like footprints, peanuts or perrier bottles. These are all, there are many terminologies to describe the appearance of this is. So typically they will be like peanut shape or footprints or perrier bottle shape. So this can be appreciated in the cytological studies under the microscope. Here I think in the first slide, we can, you can see this peanut shaped or footprint shaped or perrier bottle shaped, uh, this Melesisia yeast, uh, take, uh, which is also cellopian tape smear method, which, which we have used from the case of, uh, from a dog with a Melesisia dermatitis, which is stained with a methylene blue. And this is the second one, it's also uh, the uh, scotch, we have uh, conducted a scotch test for the dog which is suspected for the Melesisia dermatitis from the skin lesion. We have taken the sample, this is the cellopian tape and stain. This stain we have used is a GIMSA stain. So either uh, methylene blue or GIMSA can be used. So both are good. But the best method is the scotch test or the cellopian tape method. In the both uh, in the both the staining methods, we are able to appreciate the cluster of the I mean, many lamellasia yeasts in the uh, under the oil immersion. So once we see this yeast on the oil under oil immersion, we cannot just say it is. Melesisia dermatitis infection because Melesisia is or the normal commensals even from the if we take the sample uh, from the healthy dog also we, we are able to appreciate the uh, presence of yeast in the cytological smear, smears. So how to interpret because uh, like a minimal number of yeast which indicates the possibility of true Melesisia dermatitis is not is really not known. So there are so many research studies, uh, many researchers which uh, they have uh, interpreted in many ways. Like in one study, they interpreted as the average number of melesthesia organisms, if there are more than 10 per feed, will be an indicator of melesthesia overgrowth. And another one other study, they have interpreted by, they are based on the number of yeast in the cytological sphere, they can be it as one plus, two plus, three plus, four plus, like that. So depending on that, it can be considered as Melesisia overgrowth or healthy. So in one, in another study, if the number of yeast are less than two per feet, then it can be considered as healthy. Or if it is more than five yeast per feet, then it can be considered as overgrowth. And in another study, and the Melesisia dermatitis, they are quoted 100 to 10,000 fold increase in the yeast population can be considered as a Melesisia overgrowth or a Melesisia dermatitis. So again, just by counting the number of yeast, uh, we cannot confirm the condition as overgrowth or a Melesisia dermatitis because the number of yeast organisms varies according to the breed and site from, with, from where we have taken and also technique we have used and also depending depends on the host immune status because uh, from the different sites the number of uh, yeast will be different so for example numbers are higher in case of the axial region if we took a sample from the axial region absolutely uh, like the numbers will be very, very high and also more organisms are isolated with the tape strips than the other sampling methods like <coughs> scrape spear or other rolls method. 
So all these factors we need to consider uh, before uh, interpreting the result. And also there are other methods for the quantification of the algorithm like culture methods, which are mostly done in case of research studies. Again, relying on the pachydermatic discounts for the diagnosis is problematical. As I told, because the number of organ leads from different sites and different methods of collection will be will yield different results. So that's why the overlap between the counts in the healthy and disease, we cannot identify the threshold population has not been identified still. But normally in the regular practice, many clinicians will employ the therapy whenever there are clinical symptoms, clinical signs are present in the affected in the, in the dog which is presented and there are if there are yeast organisms are present with the cytological study. So if this both correlates, then most of the time the clinicians will employ the therapy, or they initiate the therapy with the antiviral drugs. And further uh, diagnosis, further we can go with the fungal culturing also for the confirmatory diagnosis. Like fungal cultures can show the presence of melesthesia. But again, here, as this melesthesia is a normal convincing on the skin, even from the healthy dogs, if you take a sample, we can get the positive cultures on the uh, media. <coughs> so, normally, the sampling can be done with the hairs, swabs, pieces of rugs where the animal is going to reside on the cloth or contact plates or liquid detergents. Again, these are the for quantification of the number of ease. So the appropriate media for melesthesia pachydermatics are Sabarot's dextrose agar with chloramphenicol and cyclohexamidine. So this chloramphenicol and cyclohexamidine will facilitate the growth of the fast growth of this uh, melesthesia pachydermatis. So and also modified dextrose agar. With this media, we can grow this uh, melesthesia yeast. Again, interpretation is very important. Though we get the positive culture, it's, it's of no or little value. Because uh, <coughs> I mentioned the second uh, the normal commensal on the skin, even the sample taken from the healthy animals also yields positive culture. So, but the number of colonies can be counted, and this can be comparable to the number of yeast which are demonstrated in the cytological examination. So, with this correlation, we can come to it. We can interpret the uh, result of the fungal cultures. So this is the uh, separate dextrose agar where you can appreciate this cream colored pack, melesthesia pachydermatis colonies and interpretation of the colony numbers like if the growth is heavy if the if the colony counts are more than 50 colony forming units and it is moderate if it is between 10 to 50 and it is very less as case if it is less than 10 cfp so this if, it, if the colony counts comes with less than 10 CFU. So many times we can consider it as healthy and more than this we can consider it as uh, pathogenic condition or the melesthesia or both. So <coughs> one more important uh, diagnostic test is the intradermal test. As I told in the initial the pathogenesis process, the melesthesia pachydermatis can itself act as an allergen and cause the atopy because it can penetrate into the striatum corneum and trigger the mast cell activation. And when the, once the mast cells are activated, it causes degranulation and contributing to the allergic inflammation. So we need to check for the hypersensitivity of this melesthesia pachydermatis also by doing the intradermal skin test. Then we need to inject the melesthesia pachydermatis allergen. Uh, and we have to check for the hypersensitivity reaction which forms a wheel. So if the dog uh, comes with the IDT positive, this intradermal test positive for this melesthesia pachydermatis antigen, then regular antifungal therapy should be indicated. It also hyposensitization. Hyposensitization means it's a exposing the dog for the melesthesia antigen progressively for, for the, with the large doses so that so as I told, this melesthesia pachydermatis can itself act as an allergen to cause the uh, hypersensitivity reaction. So intradermal test reactivity also to be checked with the suspected dog. 
because this Melesia pachydermatis antigens this penetrate into the striatum corneum, which trigger the mast cell activation and cause degranulation of the mast cells. So it contributes to the allergic inflammation. So by injecting the Melesia pachydermatis antigen into the skin, so the uh, hypersensitivity reaction to be checked whether the dog is IDT positive or not. So if the dog found IDT positive, then the regular antifungal therapy would be indicated or hyposensitization. Hyposensitization means the exposing the dog with the antigen of this Melesia pachydermatis progressively with the large quant large doses so that the severity of the hypersensitivity will be reduced and at times or even it gets abolished also with this hyposensitization process. So the one more test which can be conducted to identify the hypersensitivity of this Melesia pachydermatis is patch test. Here you can use this application of the Melesia pachydermatis extracts and also the saline controls to the skin, the canine skin for 48 hours using the filter paper discs and fin chambers. So after 48 hours, we can read the uh, presence of the hypersensitivity reaction on this skin. This is just to investigate the correlation between the results of patch and intradermal test. If the dog is found positive with the IDT, the Melesia pachydermatis allergen, then we can to confirm that we can go with this patch test also. The next diagnostic method is the cutaneous histopathology, where the presence of yeast on the surface of the epidermis and in the infundibula can be seen. Here, the, from the lesions, the punch biopsy will be taken from the, the <coughs> punch biopsy needle. So this should be processed for the histopathological studies where you can see the absence of uh, the presence of yeast in the surface of the epidermis. And also while interpreting this histopathological result, the absence of this, the mere absence of this yeast upon the histopathology does not exclude their presence. And also finding of the melesia inside the hair follicle is a confirm, uh, diag confirmatory uh, or it indicates the real pathogenicity of the condition. So again, uh, many researchers they say cutaneous histopathology is a less sensitive technique than cytology. Cytological studies are the studies the best method for the for diagnosing the melesia dermatitis. But again, it's a debatable issue whether this histopathological examination is more reliable than the tape stripping method, that is cytological tape stripping method in the primary care units. So again, it's a debatable issue whether it can consider this as a further diag regular diagnosis or not. So this is the uh, majors showing images of the histopathological sections of the uh, punch biopsy taken from the skin lesions where we can appreciate this. Melesia pachydermatis organism uh, is in the deeper layers of the stratum corneum. So, of course, as like the other uh, diseases, di disease diagnosis, molecular techniques can be employed for this condition also. Mostly in the for the research studies, we employ this. It's, it's a, because it's a, these are techniques are pivotal in accurate identification of many of the currently recognized Melesia species. So with the molecular techniques, in particular, the sequencing of the uh, D1 or D2 domain of the large subunit of this R RNA gene and also some regions, uh, the sequencing of some particular regions will allow for the accurate identification of the species, the Melesia species, and also the recognition of the different genotypes that may have relevance for the host adaptation and virulence. So especially the particularly this study will help us to know uh, more about the breed disposition, why part that particular breed is uh, predisposed for this Melesia dermatitis. So this the, for further the research studies, we can adopt these things in the academic, uh, in the acad academic or research studies can be adopted to find out the predisposition causes of different breeds and multiplex PCR and multit of my mass spectrometry can also can be done. Uh, this will help in the identification of the different species of Malassezia from the skin and also the, from the culture specimens. So along with all these diagnostic techniques, because Malassezia dermatitis is secondary to the primary skin disease, 
the other tests also should be done to determine the underlying cause because the identifying the uh, primary or that is underlying cause is very important in case of melasesia dermatitis so the other test includes blood tests majorly when the animal is uh, suspected for having hypothyroidism or any other endocrine uh, endocrine disorder as a primary cause for this the development of melasesia dermatitis then we need to get the blood test done is uh, for example hypothyroidism the serum profile the thyroid profile can be done to identify the uh, to uh, identify the primary cause as hypothyroid uh, this thyroid problem and also if the the, the melasesia dermatitis is due to is secondary to uh, atopy then allergic testing that is intradermal testing can be done with a with all the local available allergens including melasesia uh, packet dermatitis allergen and food trial should be done because food hypersensitivity also causes melasesia dermatitis has secondary so food trial can be we can ask the owner to withhold the for elimination diet trials can be done we can ask the owner to withhold the diet what they are giving for a, for some days then we can observe for the reduction in the severity of the lesions so all these tests can be done to identify the underlying cause so so after this after identification of the primary cause and uh, confirming the melasesia dermatitis we can adopt therapeutic measures this the therapeutic management it can be systemic or topical or a combination of both so most of the time in, in mild cases or if the lesions are localized frequent topical therapy with the antifungal products in the form of shampoos or sprays gels creams can be done so that uh, the systemic therapy is not required for this mild cases of the localized lesions whereas if the condition is generalized uh, with the presence of multifocal lesions oral antifungal therapy in combination with the topical therapy is most effective commonly used uh, systemic treatments are ketoconazole itraconazole fluconazole along with the uh, antibiotics cefalexin and terbinafine uh, with or without an antibiotic these can be used uh, frequent these are the frequently used systemic antifungal agents so most of the time whenever we are using this systemic uh, antifungal agents this can be supplemented with the antibiotics also because uh, the melasesia organs is are having symbiotic relationship with the staphylococcus which cause pyoderma so the in combination with the antibiotic will give good efficacy with the systemic treatment so regarding the topical therapy which is again which is an alternative to systemic treatment particularly for the localized lesions this topical therapy is given in the form of creams gels lotions or sprays so here the 2% myconazole and 2% chlorhexidine is applied twice weekly with a contact time of at least 10 minutes can be done because uh, myconazole is again antifungal and chlorhexidine is antibacterial so both will work good and give good efficacy in the uh, the local lesions the topical therapy and 3% chlorhexidine shampoo uh, using twice weekly also gives good results and chlorhexidine with or without clembazole uh, for every 3 days can also be used along with uh, by using uh, alternated with the shampoos antifungal shampoos and the shampoos containing myconazole 2% chlorhexidine at least the chlorhexidine should be 3% are in a combination of both in combination 2% each can be better and ketoconazole 2% are the best combination for as, as antifungal uh, antifungal topical applications and there are leave on rinses or lotions available with the composition of a slime sulfur and enylconazole uh, 0.2% is also more effective for topical therapy with melasesia dermatitis and there are leave on spray formulation which contains zinc ethyl laurel arginate arginate laurate 9 urea pentanol glycerin and butylene glycol so the leave on sprays which contains these chemicals can also be effective whatever the topical uh, treatments we are using they should be administered two to three times a week for two weeks or three weeks
So uh, with respect to the topical therapy, these are some active ingredients to be present in the topical th therapy uh, preparations and their properties goes like this. That is acetic acid or boric acid. Again, it's an acidifying or antimicrobial agent. Benzyl peroxide, which is having antibacterial property. It's a follicular flushing agent and also decreasing. So this will <coughs> reduce the melesthesia overgrowth. And again, chlorexidine, it's an antibacterial and along with uh, antifungal agents like clotrimazole, ketoconazole, myconazole, salicylic acid, it's again keratolytic, selenium sulfide, it's an antifungal, degreasing and keratolytic agent, sulfur, it's an antibacterial and keratolytic and it tar, so it's a degreasing, keratolytic and antiprotic. So the, any topical the pre, uh, preparations which are used for the uh, topical therapy can have this active as uh, these ingredients uh, because these are very effective for the topical therapy. And because the melesthesia dermatitis is a secondary uh, to many primary diseases, often the treatment of melesthesia dermatitis should be accompanied by other recommendations like dietary elimination trial, just to uh, rule out the uh, food hypersensitivity and antibiotic therapy to combat the pyoderma, which could be primary cause for the for this condition, and antiprorotic therapy because there will be moderate to severe pruritis in case of melesthesia dermatitis. And otitis externa, if it is there, it should be treated vigorously because it is uh, the uh, external ear is a reservoir of yeast, so. If there is any otitis extra, melesthesia otitis externa, it should be treated vigorously by using the uh, ear drops or cleansing agents which contains nystatin, thiabendazole, uh, oral antifungal drugs and also antiseptic cleansing agents. So any therapy, whether it is systemic or topical, it should be continued for 7 to 10 days beyond the clinical cure. Clinical cure means the remission of the Symptom, clinical symptoms that is the complete stoppage of the complete disappearance of the clinical symptoms even after complete disappearance of all the clinical symptoms the therapy should be continued for 7 to 10 days to prevent the relapse again while giving the treatment or while planning for the treatment of melesthesia dermatitis it should be according to the localized versus generalized disease because most of the time uh, for the localized disease we prefer topical therapy and if it is generalized systemic or a combination of both systemic and topical and also overall patient health is also should be considered because most of the antifungal drugs are uh, cause uh, hepatotypotoxic and some adverse reactions will be some side effects will be there so overall patient health should be uh, should be looked into that before giving the therapy and also underlying the primary cause. So the primary cause should be identified and specific therapy for that primary disease also should be addressed. And one more very important thing while tailoring the treatment, uh, this one is a client preference or compliance because most of the time the application of the gels, creams or sprays are uh, bathing weekly twice with the antifungal shampoos. Many clients preference will be giving the tablets or some syrups that the systemic therapy they will be preferred by the clients. So that is also uh, we should keep it in mind the client's preference while uh, initiating the therapy for the melesthesia dermatitis. And extensive topical therapy can be challenging in dogs with thick hair coat and also for the large uh, dogs and non-compliant dogs. Though the topical therapy is enough if the dogs are having the localized lesions. Again, it is very difficult to treat if the dog is having thick hair coat or some large drugs, large breed dogs or if the dogs are not cooperative. So depending on these conditions also we have to consider whether the topical therapy can be initiated or we can go with the systemic therapy. So again left to the discretion of the clinician by seeing the con by considering these aspects. But in generally it is preferable to use a combination of topical and systemic therapy in order to achieve rapid and complete remission of the clinical signs. After initiating the therapeutic uh, uh, therapy for the melesthesia dermatitis, the follow-up is very important because the improve if there is any improvement in the condition, it again it confirms the diagnosis. That is response to the therapy. 
So if the animal is responding with, with the remission of the clinical symptoms means the, it confirms the diagnosis as it's a melesthesia overgrowth or a melesthesia dermatitis. Normally after initiating the therapy, the pruritis which decreases within a one week, the, first, the first symptom, this pruritis symptom will get reduced and later after two weeks, the lesion, the skin lesions, uh, that erythematous lesions, hyperpigmentation, lichenification, all these clinical symptoms, the skin lesions will start decreasing. And the duration of treatment should be at least three weeks to one month. Or uh, sometimes, depending on the severity of the condition, it may go as long as two months to get the complete recovery. But minimum three weeks to one month treatment should be given. So depending on the severity, it may further go. And one more uh, uh, very important thing about the melesthesia dermatitis is idiopathic melesthesia dermatitis. So what is this idiopathic melesthesia dermatitis? It is a melesthesia dermatitis where there is no primary conditions uh, uh, present or which are controlled. The primary con uh, skin problems are ruled out. Even then the, the melesthesia overgrowth will be there in the absence of primary causes. This is called idiopathic melesthesia dermatitis. So in these conditions, uh, the relapses will be common. So this can be prevented by giving pulse therapy. Pulse therapy means by ad administration of the antifungal drugs uh, once or two days in a week or, uh, or by using the weekly topical treatments, this idiopathic melesthesia dermatitis can be controlled. Again, the pulse therapy, though it works good for this, uh, in though it works good in preventing the relapse, Again, it may pose a antifungal resistance also. One should keep it in, keep this also in mind while uh, giving this pulse therapy with the antifungal drugs. So this, there are some, these are the reports of different uh, research studies which they have undertaken with different therapeutic, uh, uh, different treatment trials to manage the derma, melesthesia dermatitis. Uh, in one case, in the, for melesthesia otitis externa, they have used ear cleanser for 15 days and ear drops for one week, where they have used the ear cleanser, which uh, comprising the chlorhexidine, again, which removes the microbes and also acts as a drying agent. So drying agent means because the moisture uh, allows the melesthesia to overgrow. So because the chlorhexidine is a drying agent, it prevents the growth of the melesthesia and propylene glycol, the one more compo constitute in this ear cleanser, which prevents the microbial addition, which block by blocking the carbohydrate, and tris buffer EDTA, and it inhibits the growth of pathogen and potentiate the action of antimicrobial drug. So the, this ear cleanser can be used uh, in the, they have used this ear cleanser in the dog with the melesthesia otitis externa, followed by instilling the ear drops twice a day for one week, Whereas they have used ear cleanser for a 15 days. This ear drops contains antibacterial, antifungal, and glucocorticoids uh, agents. This glucocorticoids, which uh, helps in reduction and inflammation of the pruritis, and antibacterial and antifungal agents uh, inhibits the growth and multiplication of the melesthesia organisms. So the combination of this ear cleanser and ear drops gave a good efficacy, uh, and uh, they have reported a complete recovery. Of by using this ear cleanser and ear drops. And in one more study, they have used ear only the ear cleanser for seven days, uh, which contains 2% boric acid or acetic acid. So uh, anyway, with the procedure for the ear cleansing is the fill the ear canal to overflowing with the ear cleanser, massage the ear canals. After five minutes, wipe out the any overflow with a cotton ball. And again, with this uh, uh, study, they have repeated the same procedure for six more days for a total one week. They have done the ear cleansing with this and they have reported a good results with this uh, by the use of only ear cleanser in case of melesthesia otitis externa. And regarding the melesthesia dermatitis, in one study, they have reported good efficacy with a 2% myconazole with 2% chlorhexidine topical application for three weeks. And in the second and one next in the next study, in one more study, they have used ketoconazole at the dose rate of 10 mg per kg along with the local application of myconazole lotion for three weeks, which gave the very good result. They have noticed a reduction in the number of yeast and clinical improvement also, that is remission of the clinical symptoms. And 
in one more study they have used uh, antifungal drugs along with the herbal product that is fluconazole they have used as antifungal drug at the dose rate of 5 mg per kg and herbal neem powder at the dose rate of 50 mg per kg along with the antibiotic cephalexin they have used cinnamarin also because it's a hepatoprotective drug because antifungal drugs causes hepatotoxicity to some extent so they have used cinnamarin here and along with this systemic therapy they have used topical application of neem seed oil and also a shampoo which is containing 2% myconazole and fluoroxidin so with this combination of systemic and topical therapy they got very good result as they reported and in one more uh, other study they have used uh, three therapies in the three groups of dogs with uh, which had, which had derm melesthesia dermatitis where in the first group of dogs they have used 2% myconazole and 2% chlorhexidine shampoo shampoo twice weekly where they got very good uh, efficacy and in the second group they have used only 3% chlorhexidine shampoo where they got only moderate uh, result and in the third group ketoconazole along uh, they have used uh, antifungal drug ketoconazole and <coughs> ketoconazole once or twice daily with this only systemic therapy of the ketoconazole they got moderate results so uh, with this uh, report what they concluded was uh, the combination of both topical and systemic therapy is good for the treatment or therapeutic management of the malassezia dermatitis and in one the one more study which uh, they have done the different antifungal drugs in the dogs with the malassezia dermatitis the first group they have used terpenophyne along with the antibiotic cephalexin and in the second group they have used ketoconazole along with the cephalexin and in the third group they have given only the antibiotic cephalexin without any antifungal drug where for three weeks period so where they found very good efficacy with the first in the first group where they have used terpenophyne along with the cephalexin where the very very less reduction of the number of yeast was noticed in the third group that is where they have used only cephalexin so these are the some reports of the therapeutic uh, trials from the research studies so next is the melesthesia hypersensitivity that is uh, because some dogs are allergic to the the melesthesia pachydermatis allergen uh, this act as a allergen so if you are suspecting that melesthesia hypersensitivity then there will be recurrent or persistent melesthesia dermatitis can be seen in that particular dog and uh, if there is recurrent or persistent uh, infection then that dog should be suspected for having this hypersensitivity to the melesthesia as long as the underlying primary cause is well managed or ruled out so uh, though the primary cause is identified and ruled out many times the melesthesia dermatitis will be relapsing that that type of dogs can be considered as allergic to this are showing hypersensitivity to melesthesia so in for those type of dogs in, in those type of dogs we, we can see the higher levels of melesthesia specific immunoglobulin e and also uh, intradermal test is, uh, will be positive so for such type of dogs the therapy can be immunotherapy with the melesthesia pachydermatis antigens as i told hypothera um, hyposensitivity procedure can be done to reduce the hypersensitivity or to completely abolish the hypersensitivity or else uh, in the clinical practice we can give pulse therapy with any antifungal drug you normally itraconazole or ketoconazole can be used as a pulse therapy after all uh, the prognosis of this disease yes of course it carries a good prognosis because it's a skin condition that to secondary to the other primary uh, skin disorder so until unless the efforts should be made to identify the causative factors such as underlying uh, it could be allergies or endocrine disorder or it could be skin, uh, pyoderma anything so and if the primary cause is identified and address the melesthesia dermatitis will carry a good prognosis because once the concurrent infections are a primary condition disease is adequately treated the management of this melesthesia pachydermatis is very straight forward just by using the antifungal drugs either it could be topical or systemic or a combination of both depending on the condition so prevention 
because many a times the relapse of this infection is very common. We need to prevent uh, uh, the prevention is equally important like therapy. Then how to prevent uh, this Pelasisia pachydermatis is correct the underlying cause. Yeah, because this most of the time it is secondary uh, to the primary cause. The idiopathic Pelasisia dermatitis is very rare. So primary cause should be addressed and it should be treated. So then we can consider the intermittent topical therapy. It's a preferred option for the long term. To prevent the disease, we can use some topical agents, preferably the shampoos which contain antibacterial agent and also antifungal agent. And one more plan to prevent the disease is considering the pulse treatment. Again, the pulse treatment which may pose the development of res antifungal resistance. So uh, better, better option here is the long term topical therapies to prevent the menacea dermatitis and allergen specific immunotherapy also can be used if the dog is suspected for having melasesia hypersensitivity. So this melasesia also is having a zoonotic potential because uh, it was uh, noticed in neonatal intensive care unit where it was introduced by the hands of healthcare workers which was transmitted to them by contact with the pet dogs. So easily this melasesia can uh, transmit to human beings also like to the hands of the human beings and also there is a case report in 2006 uh, where there is a development of facial granuloma where the pathogen they identified was melasesia pachydermatis in from a, in, in a dog owner uh, the dog had this melasesia overgrowth so because of this zoonotic potential good hand hygiene by the individuals in contact with the pet dogs is very important especially when these uh, uh, owners dog owners or dog, dog owners are contacting with the immunocompromised individuals so finally the conclusions regarding the melasesia pachydermatis is a relatively common skin condition in dogs which is secondary to many primary causes and many times it mimics the common dermatosis so it looks like pyre, the lesions look like spiderma uh, atopy many other conditions so the, the diagnosis of this condition is very important the history and clinical signs are compatible for the diagnosis and also side, uh, equally the cytological examination is equally important for the confirmatory diagnosis we need to correlate with the clinical symptoms and the cytological uh, smear interpretation results and the underlying uh, causes or primary condi conditions should be addressed like allergic skin disease or demodicosis endocrine disorders like hypothyroidism should be addressed uh, prim prim this, uh, all these primary causes should be addressed before initiating the treatment of melasesia dermatitis then the melasesia dermatitis management will be very straightforward just by using the antifungal drugs. So after all this, uh, I just I, th I want to thank to the Association for Veterinary Dermatology for giving me this opportunity and also Intos Animal Health for the opportunity given and our university KVFSU and all the webinar participants and also I cannot uh, neglect the lovely dogs which because of their suffering we have we are able to learn all these things. Thank you. Thank you all. Dr. Lata Mani, can you hear me? Hello, Lata. OK, I'll tell the answer. Actually, uh, it is better to go for a shampoos and also the neem. Neem is the best treatment that is uh, you can apply externally neem and turmeric. Uh, that can be used as a treatment in puppies so that uh, it won't affect the liver. Uh, and uh, instead of going for oral systemic therapy, we can very well go for frequent uh, antifungal shampoos. That is also one of the good way to uh, roll out or a good way to treat the puppies with the mother Thank you, sir. A good way to answer the questions also when the speaker is not available. So, uh, Dr. Lata, are you there or we are missing you? Uh, sir, the next question is, uh, when to when should we prefer a topical therapy and when should we prefer a oral therapy? If it is it going to be less severe, 
or uh, mild we can very well go for topical therapy the topical therapy also it should be uh, the frequency is decided by the veterinarian uh, if it is going to be severe it will uh, you have to uh, go for weekly twice or thrice like that and uh, if it is going to be very mild you can give weekly once that is quite sufficient if it is going to be very severe chronic cases like uh, lichenification or uh, hyperpigmentation all of that then we can very well go for uh, shampooing as well as uh, oral uh, oral therapy oral therapy means the lot of research they have identified and give a, a report they have identified itraconazole uh, and ketoconazole was found to be uh, wonderfully acting uh, along with the shampoos if it is going yes, to and terbinafine is uh, more effective when compared to the ketoconazole and hydroconazole with uh, with respect to the side effects and hepatotoxicity terbinafine is very uh, very good see you have to see the evidence based medicine overall uh, throughout world they have identified uh intraconazole or ketoconazole uh, box because of some uh, reasons and in cat it is very much useful it is very highly useful in uh, cat turn off okay so the next question you or lata ma'am can answer is yes yes apart yes, apart from the shampoos apart from the oral therapy any mm. further agents that you would recommend for treating malesthesia only any other supportives uh yeah apart from the shampoos and systemic therapy yes yeah, sprays can be used sir if the uh, owner complaints is not there for uh, using uh, shampoos uh, for bathing regularly then they can go with the uh, sprays which can it's be very easy for the owners to use which contains the antifungal and antibacterial agent ma'am i'll reframe the question the question says apart from antifungal topical and apart oral, from antifungal okay okay yeah. okay um, anything that we can use to have a better mic against malesthesia fungus so that they are able to kill the better it is essential fatty acid if you are going to add any uh, fat along with antifungal it will improve the efficacy of the drug so that is what uh, so you, you can always use essential fatty acid Yes. that will help in uh, uh, attaining more concentration of the antifungal as well as uh, it will improve the coat of the dog right sir that brings us to the end of the session i on behalf of avd and intas thank uh, dr lata mani for taking us in a journey to malesthesia dermatitis in dogs we thank you ma'am on behalf of all of us and the audience for being a part of our webinar thank you sir thank you thank you, thank you sir thank you